I'm Lance Lambert. Thanks for tuning in to the Vintage Vehicle Show. We are in Oxnard, California at the Mullen Automotive Museum. This is a collection of French cars that you are not going to believe. They are just stunning. Probably the best collection of French cars in the world. We are going to do what you do every week. You're going to see some great cars and meet somebody really special. So do what I tell you to do every week. Just kick back, relax, and enjoy the show. We are very fortunate to be with Andrew Riley. He is the curator here at the Mullen Automotive Museum. Andrew, welcome to the Vintage Vehicle Show. Thank you so much, Lance. Glad to be here. Big question, how did this all come about? Well, it's not a simple question, of course, but it's really the culmination of 30 years of collecting uh, by Peter Mullen and the realization of a dream in that respect. Uh, Peter Mullen is an Angelino, but someone who has always had a fascination with, uh, with French cars and it's, as I say, it's been a fascination that's been with him for 30 years. Why French cars? The guy's from Los Angeles. Why isn't this full of 57 Chevs in here? How did this happen? I think it's because uh, Mr. Mullen believes that these cars represent the apex of automotive development, that they are you know, moving sculpture, moving art, and that there was something special about the 1930s, especially about pre-war France, that uh, that made these cars special. Andrew, you obviously and Mr. Mullen think this is this is the the pride and joy of the place. You have it on the turntable. Uh, every square inch of this car is spectacular. We could do easily do an hour show, two hour show just on this car. What are we looking at? What you have here is a 1936 Bugatti Type 57 SC. Atlantic or Atlantique in French and it is the first of four production Atlantics that were produced between 1936 and 1939. They only made four of these. They only made four of them. The Bugatti Type 57 of course is one of the most celebrated models of the Bugatti Mark 
and it was an attempt by Bugatti to really revitalize their operation. And so this car was very conscientiously designed to be something radical in its day. It's an all-aluminum uh, automobile that was powered by a dual overhead cam, straight eight, supercharged engine, which made it beyond being just a beautiful car, also one of the fastest cars in the world in 1936. I don't see a straight line on this thing anywhere. No, not at all. And this was a part of a movement that was afoot in the mid to late 1930s, which was streamlining and teardrop styled cars. What's so radical about this car ultimately is how modern it is. Modern not only in terms of its technology, but also modern in terms of its image. As you look at this car, you'll note that it has this external spine that wraps the fenders, runs along the center line of the car. Right. All of that was a celebration of the way in which this car, in fact, was put together. So as opposed to being just pure sculpture, this is a car that was saying, look at how I was made. And that was a very uh, special aspect of this car. This car was based upon a prototype car that was known as the Aeroleith Electron Coupe. And what that tells us is that automotive engineers in the 1930s were really looking at aviation as a form of inspiration. The history of the car, who, who was the first owner, do you know? Or? Yes, the first owner uh, was Lord Victor Rothschild of the Rothschild yeah. Banking family. He ordered it while he was still a, a university student at Cambridge. Yeah. Not a bad college yeah, car, right? Yeah, A little nicer than my 64 Rambler that I had in college. Yeah, so. yeah I think so. I know it's not French. But it's sleek, but in where we have an, an elegant car that we just looked at, the, the Atlantic, this is more of a kind of a warm and fuzzy puppy car almost. It's, it's so unusual. You um, think so? I, I do. I, I'll, 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 give, I'll give you unusual, but I, I don't know if this is warm and fuzzy. Okay, I'll tell you. For, for, for me, this is streamlined modernism. And uh, rightly, you've chosen one of perhaps only three non-French cars on the floor here. So it's an interesting choice. But the, the point being that when you talk about automobiles built between, say, 1920 and 1940, that you're really seeing this tidal shift in terms of design. In 1920, of course, it was on vogue to build very luxurious cars, cars that really spoke to their hand-wrought, hand-built nature. Well, not so come 1940. By the latter half of the 1930s, of course, you saw streamlining, and you saw modernism. Most people who look at the Tatra, this is a Tatra T87, will say, isn't that a Volkswagen? Mm -hmm. And uh, understandably so, because Ludvinka, the, the man who uh, developed this car in Czechoslovakia, um, had the design basically stolen from him by Ferdinand Porsche uh -huh. at the direction of Hitler. But this car is distinct from the, you know, the Volkswagen Beetle, was a luxury car. Remember that in 1938, you're looking at a car that was powered by a V8, an air-cooled V8 engine. And when you examine this car in, at its, in detail, you'll see a car that's very luxuriously appointed. This car was as expensive as any Bentley or Rolls-Royce of that same time. They were not easy cars to drive, as I understand it. In because fact, of the weight? Because of the weight. The ratio, uh -huh. Right. But of course, that's what uh, Porsche excelled in eventually. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the point was that when you have all that weight in the rear, that you had to make sure that when you were going through the turn that you really kept your foot buried in the accelerator. Uh -huh. These cars were oftentimes uh, conscribed by the SS officers uh, during the war, and many of them, in fact, lost their lives driving them uh -huh. because they, it was an unusual driving experience, uh -huh. I'm told. Another spectacular car, sweeping lines, beautiful. Tell us about this car. Well, you've chosen well here. This is one of the stars of the Mullen Automotive Museum collection, 1939 Bugatti Type 57C, C standing for compressor. And this car's design is known as the Aravis. And this it was a very limited production car. They only made three of them. Uh, uh, Gangloff, uh, the de facto in-house bodybuilder for Bugatti, uh, designed this car. It was, to be clear, a rich man's car, probably $18,000 in uh, 1939, but it really had both elegance and sport. This car is a car whose qualities really are exuded again through its detail. Beautifully pointed interior, you know, elegant exterior lines. 
And Jean Bugatti, Ettore Bugatti's son, who in fact developed the Type 57 Bugatti, was known to have said that this car was the most beautiful Type 57 that he ever built. So it's a, a, a beautiful car. It's a car that uh, Maurice wished that he had never sold. In fact, when this car was restored by Mr. Mullen, he had Maurice Trentignon, then in his 80s, come over and oversee the car's restoration and say, you know, this was the color, this was the original specification of this car, this shade of blue, this shade of cream, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was uh, a car that he wished that he'd never sold, uh, a real masterpiece of Bugatti's design. And of course, you look at it here and it's been comprehensively restored. Mm -hmm. This is an example of uh, very similar to what we just looked at, only this kind of looks like it came out of the factory and hasn't changed since then. And you're correct. This is, interestingly, almost an identical chassis, an identical chassis, actually, to the car that we just looked at. 1939 Bugatti Type 57. In this particular instance, it's, again, a compressor car, so it's a 57C coupe, in this case. This was a uh, one-off, as best as we know, Van Voren car, very similar in its lines to the factory-bodied Adelant, but a car that uh, was in one family's ownership for more than 50 years, and today I believe the odometer shows 10,503 original kilometers. Wow. So again, an incredibly uh, exclusive car that was always held very closely by one family, and today it's a time warp. What's so exciting to me as the curator of the museum is to be able to present people with a car that shows them how these cars were originally presented the way in which the paint was applied, the materials choices, the upholstery, the way it was stitched, the uh, engine compartment. You know, it's interesting to consider that this car, with the evolution of the car collecting hobby, that this car in its current condition is perhaps more celebrated than a, a comprehensively restored car. Were you to take this car and restore it, it would arguably be diminished both in terms of its historical significance and also in terms of its monetary value. So you could easily put two hundred, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars into a restoration of this car and end up with a car that was worth less than when you started. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. 1951 Delahaye, this thing looks like it's about to leap over the cameras. This is, this is a really sexy, forward-looking, uh, really gorgeous car. Yes, and it really belies what was about to happen to Delahaye. This is a 1951 Delahaye 235 Cabriolet. It was basically a warmed over version of the pre-war Delahaye 135. After the war, Delahaye, like the auto industry in France in general, was in a great deal of disarray. And so the 235 was an attempt to revive the brand, but it proved to be prohibitively expensive. Uh, it in, in no small part because of the fact that they were fit with this bespoke coachwork. This particular car, in fact, is unique. It was one of only four Sauchik bodied Delahaye 235s. But it came out the same time as Jaguar released its XK120, the difference being that you could buy a Jaguar XK120 for $3,500. This car carried a price tag of double that, $7,000. I know a lot of, of the makers of cars, and, and I'm asking if it, this happened with the French cars. When Packard ran into some rough times, they started kind of cheapening the cars. Did any, did, did Bugatti or Delahaye or Talbot or anybody, did they do that, or they stuck to their guns till they went out of business? Well, you could say, you could say that to a certain extent, but I think that the way in which that really happened was that they allowed their technology to lag behind. And so again, with this car, they were reliant upon really an outdated technology uh, post-war. And of course, you have to remember that Delahaye also had to deal with competition not only from Jaguar, but from that upstart Aston Martin, as well as the fact that the French people, by and large, uh, were looking to the United States, of course, immediately after the war. If you look at the grill of this car as an example, you say, well, hold on, that's clearly that's an American inspiration. Uh, you know, French uh, citizens who had managed to set aside some money and were looking for a new car in the immediate post-war years was, were either buying British 
or they were buying American. They wanted a Chrysler, they wanted a Cadillac. And so the deck was really stacked against Delahaye. Uh -huh. And unfortunately, as I say, this car came out in 1951. 1954, Delahaye shuttered its windows. What's the power plan on this? This is a six-cylinder engine, triple carburetor, and with, with a high compression head. Uh, and it, it's a, a reasonable performance car. Believe me, you drive a car that's this beautiful, and you're not thinking about performance in that respect. Uh, so it was, it was a reasonable road car, and it certainly was elegant, and it was well appointed in terms of its interior, but it wasn't, it wasn't winning races, let's put it that way. And that wasn't the point. There were only 84 of these cars that were produced, incidentally, in total. This car, this is a mess. This thing is really, this is probably, this is the worst car we've ever had on. Why, why is this here? You speak with the Mullins, they'll tell you this car is too valuable to restore. But really the point behind this car, 1925 Bugatti Brescia, is to say, can you continue to appreciate a car once it has been stripped from its ability to provide meaningful transportation? So clearly what you're looking at here is more an object of art than it is an automobile but it's referential enough to its past that you can see the basic structure of an automobile. You can see where the, you know, how the frame uh, exists and how the you know, major components of the car fit together. So it's wonderful as a museum exhibit, incidentally, because it acts as a teaching tool for us. And also, it asks people to look at a, a car as fine art, to look again at surface and to uh, appreciate it just as a static object. How, how did this come to be in this condition? Well, it was under the waters of Lago Maggiore for over 75 years. Uh -huh. So, you know, we're, we're very proud of that here at the museum, incidentally, because uh, today, of course, you hear everybody talking about barn find cars, but who else has a lake find car? Or a barnacle find or car. Or a bar barnacle find car, uh -huh, right. Yeah, it's true. So lots of fish have swam through this over the years. You have to imagine. And yet it's a car that has tremendous history. This is a car that was known to have been owned by the famous French world champion race driver René Dreyfus. It was lost in a poker game to a Swiss by the name of Edelbert Baudet. He drove it back to his native Switzerland 
and uh, purportedly was evading uh, the tax man by taking this car and attaching chains to it and pushing it into Lago Maggiore. Uh, I guess the, uh, the flaw in the plan was he used a rusty chain uh. because the car fell to, uh, I guess, 175 feet and it remained there for, as I say, 75 years. But the Mullen Automotive Museum, of course, is proud to have it. And you'd be amazed. This is one of the most popular attractions here at the museum. You, you, know, you see all these multiple million dollar uh, priceless uh, automobiles here. And it's really this car that seems to speak to them. We've looked at a lot of luxury cars, and we've looked at a lot of sporting cars, but uh, the French build a lot of race cars, and I think a lot of people, when they think of Bugatti, they think of race cars before they think of luxury. This is the race car? Well, certainly one of the stars of this collection. And it's important to talk, of course, about the Grand Prix cars, and certainly the Grand Prix past of Bugatti, because were it not for their success on the racetrack, perhaps we wouldn't have the road cars that were to follow. And, of course, racing, too, is always a test bed for automotive development. And so here you're looking at one of the most exclusive uh, Bugatti race cars. This is a 1931 Bugatti Type 51 Grand Prix car uh, powered by a dual overhead cam, straight eight supercharged engine. And, of course, you look at the size of this car, you know, it wasn't, you can tell immediately that the power to weight ratio was extraordinary. So uh, this was an uprated version of Bugatti's famous Type 35 Grand Prix car, and it was its effort to really be competitive with Alfa and Mercedes-Benz, which were really developing the upper hand by that point in time. So, Would this have been strictly a race car, or would uh, you know, the, the young uh, um you know, man about town, drive this around, and then drive it to the racetrack. Well, it's, it's funny because uh, were a Tori Bugatti standing here, he would tell you, of course, that he never built race cars, that he built cars and people took them racing. But you can't say that about a, a Bugatti Type 51. I mean, clearly this was an out-and-out -out effort to uh, best the field uh, in competition. <laughs> Another car that looks like a teardrop. It's, it's beautiful. What is this? 1938 Talbot Lago T150 CSS, but it was known as goutte d'eau, which meant either water droplet or teardrop. And uh, sure enough, it was because Joseph Fagoni, uh, in 1938, really at the height of his powers as a coach builder, was asking himself a simple question. What is it about uh, the this particular shape. Why is it that water, as it falls through the atmosphere, assumes a particular form? And, of course, it was only the Germans that were really using wind tunnel testing. But Joseph Fagoni said, there has to be something magical about that form. And so the, the curves of this car, the shape of this car, was a very literal translation of that, especially these front fenders. 
I mean, they just seem to go on and on and on and on. But if you look at the side glass or the trailing rear fenders, it's really spectacular. And this car was a masterpiece in design. You know, people will point to this car and they'll say, I challenge you to find one straight line in this uh -huh. entire car. And sure enough, this is a car that doesn't prejudice any one particular angle. If you walk around it, you'll say, boy, it looks equally good from, from any position. So the, the water drop uh, analogy or the, the wind testing, it proved that this is the best body style? Absolutely. It was incredibly wind cheating in terms of its characteristics, virtually negligible drag coefficient. Uh -huh. And the running gear in this, what's, what's the motor? It's a four liter uh, triple carb Hemi head engine. Mm. So for Americans who love yeah, Hemi's, you yeah. know, I think a lot of people are surprised to know that there were Hemi head cars as early as 1938. If somebody wants to find the museum, how do, they, how do they get here? How do they find out all about it, where it is, how to see the cars, how do they do that? Uh, the simplest way is to go to our website, which is mullenautomotivemuseum.com. All right, and you are open a couple times a month for the, to the public? and Typically the second and fourth Saturdays of the month, Okay. and by prior appointment. All right. Well, this, uh, this has been an amazing tour here. This is uh, phenomenal. There, there's, you know, I don't know how many words I can come up with to describe this collection, but there, there's not enough of them. This is an amazing collection. So, uh, Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you very and much. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you. Really Would you tell uh, Peter Mullen that we uh, certainly appreciate the visit? I'll be certain to. All right. And we appreciate your visit. Thank you very much for tuning in to the Vintage Vehicle Show, and we'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye. say technology, uh, technologic, technologically, <laughs> that's the word, thank <laughs> you.